Hi everyone. My name is Aliyah Evison and I'm the speaker outreach chair this year. I thank you. <laughs> I'm also a second year in the art design in the public domain program here at the GSD. I hope you all are well fed by this point in the day. <laughs> And I hope you got some sunshine, got to connect with each other so that we can finish strong with the second half of today's programming. For our next panel, Black Power Meets the Digital Equity and Justice in Technology and Media, we are joined by Ladipo Famodu, who is also here as a facilitator with Black Space. I wanted to make the distinction that there is the Black Space, which Pierce spoke about last night, and also Black Space, the organization that actually emerged out of the 2015 conference here at Black and Design. Ladipo is from the Black Space Chicago chapter, and you can catch him later today and tomorrow for the Black Space Breakout workshops. Ladipo is a researcher, artist, and futurist based in Chicago. His developing practice, Astro Afro Studio, seeks to address the present and future threats to social equality and environmental sustainability by weaponizing art, design, and technology in a creative, subversive manner. He embraces opportunities for experimental, collaborative learning, and believes in the power of imagination. What an honor to have him joining us as our moderator. Please welcome Ladipo Fomodu. Thank you, Aliyah, for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I believe in the power of, power of words. That's something that has been mentioned a couple times uh, this conference so far. So in the introduction, I, I said that it's a developing studio practice of mine. So that means that I haven't figured it out yet. Um, I might not even have any major projects going on. But this is something that I'm working for. And I believe that it's, it's powerful for me to be able to articulate my vision. Um, so if anyone is interested in kind of the way that I'm, I'm positioning my practice, I'll be here all weekend. If someone has you know, projects that they think that sort of analysis would be beneficial, um, hit me up. That would be, be awesome. Um, so I'm going to introduce our, our panelists, our speakers here. First we have Ari Milenciano. She is a Brooklyn-based interdisciplinary artist, designer, creative technologist and researcher who was passionate about exploring the relationships between various forms of design and the human experience. Her research lies at the intersection of imaginative uses of computer inter human computer interactive technologies for creativity, societal impacts of tech, race, culture, experimental design, experimental pedagogy, and speculative design. She is the founder of the, the Media Arts, Culture, and Technology Festival Afrotechtopia. She's also an adjunct, adjunct professor at NYU Tisch School of the Arts, teaching in both the Interactive Telecommunications Graduate Program, ITP, and Photo and Imaging Undergraduate Program. Please help uh, me welcome Adi to the stage. Next, we have Billy L. Allman. Billy Allman is a designer and storyteller who highlights the connection between nature, technology, and design. Over the last three years, Billy has been traveling around the world, exploring how biological strategies are being used to inspire solutions to human challenges through the process called biomimicry. Billy also has a TV show set to premiere on Animal Planet this fall, featuring some of his explorations. Uh, he has a bachelor's of architecture degree from Howard University and a master's of science. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And a master's of science in biomim biomimicry from Arizona State University. Please help welcome Billy to the stage. <laughs> Next, we have Bridget Wallace. Bridget Wallace is an out-of-the-box thinker who pushes hard for equity and inclusion for those that are undervalued and overlooked. Her goal is inclusion by creating and supporting additional tech pipelines that enhances the city's innovation mix. As an urban planner and founder of Dudley Vision Skylab and founder of 
founder of the G-Code House, she has worked with institutions, coalitions, community residents, and city officials to, to develop economic networks and programs around inclusive growth and strategies, growth strategies and entrepreneurship. Her current project, G-Code House, is a visionary residential incubator for women of color ages 18 to 25, tackling a range of issues, including the lack of diversity in tech, housing security, gentrification, the work and workforce inequality. Additionally, Bridget has, is particularly, particularly interested in rebuilding the ways Roxbury and other neighborhood economies emerge by delivering specialized, efficient, and innovative plans that fuel long-term economic growth for black, brown, and Im immigrant residents. Uh, prior to developing the initial plans for the Skylab and G-Code, Ms. Wallace worked for the city, state, and nonprofit sector. She received her master's in urban planning with a concentration in economic development from Tufts University. Uh, she is a proud mother to her daughter who recently graduated from Northeastern's Damar De Kim School of Business. I might have said that wrong, but that will go on to work in the tech sector. She serves on the board of the Roxbury Neighborhood Council and on the Project Renew Committee for Plan Dudley. Please help welcome Bridget to the stage. <laughs> and finally, we have Jerome Harris. Jerome is a graphic designer originally from New Haven, Connecticut, and is currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, he holds an MFA in graphic design from Yale University and a BA from Temple. Um, Harris is the designer. Harris is the design director of Housing Works, a nonprofit organization fighting the HIV, AIDS, and homelessness crisis in New York City. He has also curated a touring exhibition titled As Not For, which celebrates African American graphic designers active in the 20th century. Harris also DJs under the moniker DJ Glenn Coco, and, <laughs> and he maintains an ongoing choreographic practice that he shares on Instagram. Uh, his handle is at 32 counts. So please help welcome uh, Jerome to the stage. So I'm going to ask, first of all, a question to the whole group, and then we'll get specifically into each uh, individually questions directed at your practice, and then we'll open it up to, dis to uh, Q&A. So first question for you all, whoever wants to jump in first. Um, historically, there are many instances of technology and media being used to further oppress black communities. What is one way you envision the opposite to be true? How can new technology and media instead be a mechanism for transformative justice? Greetings, people of Earth. Um, the first thing that jumps to my mind is I feel like coding has the potential to be what hip hop has been for so many people as a gateway for creating the futures from your desktop, from your room uh, that you envision. And I think it potentially could be the thing that further levels the, pl uh, the playing field for a lot of people of color. Um, because we have that creativity, we were just talking about how we came to this country with that creativity. That was what they sought out. We, they were looking for builders. They were looking for farmers. They were looking for people who knew how to make things. So that is inherent to us. Um, uh, yeah. And even just speaking on coding of just having access to learning how to do it, it's, not, it's no longer you needing to go to get a master's degree or study computer science in school. It's you learning on YouTube. Uh, so just that access, democracy of education has been big and then creating spaces where people are thinking about um, technology, not just in a lens of let's create these really cool, innovative things and not think about how it's impacting people, but also creating spaces where we're learning about sociology. So I think um, 
things like Nicole Hannah Jones 1619 project of that just completely revolutionizing the way that we're thinking about this country and starting from there and then applying that to technology, um, having these kind of worlds come together where we're building but thinking about people at the same time. Hi again. So um, for me and the work that I'm doing, like I'm developing uh, an alternative pipeline into coding um, by using my property um, as, a, as an incubator. So the young women that I'm targeting are 18 to 25 uh, who um, will come either with a GED or some of them with college experience uh, in computer science and come and live in this sort of living incubator. They will live in there for up to two years where we'll teach them coding, uh, connect them to internships and place them and hopefully by way of um, this experience and this opportunity, change the, the pathway, the trajectory of their lives, because uh, we're opening up opportunities for them. But we're also building in a network for them so that they'll be working alongside other young women of color uh, who are experiencing the same things that they are um, as they are often um, going to work in environments that are not welcoming, um, but they will have a grounding and a welcoming and supportive environment within this property that we're creating. Um, and why I'm also focused on this is because um, often college and universities, those are like very linear paths into tech and coding, um, but your careers are often not. So creating spaces for them to think outside the box, to think about creative ways of engaging with that space and engaging with uh, tech is something that we'll also be uh, exploring uh, in the property. Um, so just having had done a bunch of research into African-American graphic designers, I think archiving and the dissemination of knowledge through old media like books, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's cool, but then like thinking about new ways to bring kind of uh, archives into a more digital space, not just like logging on to, um, you know, the Cornell University site, but how can you use um, AI or um, AR or uh, machine learning to make knowledge more accessible to more people more quickly? Yeah. So. Awesome. Thanks for those answers, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with Adi. Um, question for you about Afrotectopia. So in creating this conference, how have you challenged conventional notions of what is possible through technology? And if you want to elaborate about what Afrotectopia is, first of all, and then you can go into that. For one, it's really great to be here. Um, I came here two years ago for the first time, and that was around the time that I was thinking about Afrotectopia um, and researching, going to different spaces and seeing what are black people doing in their own space when they feel siloed and are trying to create this community around people that are also thinking similar to them in their own profession. So coming here two years ago and then being here on the stage and having realized it, having realized Afrotectopia twice is really uh, special for me. And so what, thank you. <laughs> Afrotectopia, uh, to explain it, it came out of a lot of um, different personal experiences navigating the tech world. I entered the tech world maybe three years ago and going to graduate school at NYU in this program called Interactive Telecommunications um, and loved it because I was entering as an artist and someone that just loved to create things, but always not being satisfied in the way that my art would be realized and that it wasn't interactive or immersive in the ways that digital work can uh, emphasize and further whatever art you're creating. So entering that space and seeing ways that I could be creative but also uh, do it in a digital kind of space was exciting. Um, and learning about all these technologies and seeing kind of how, how easy they are. They don't have to be these difficult, uh, convoluted kind of things. Having access to that was exciting. But I was also thinking, wow, this stuff is n it's not that difficult. And what would it be like if all my friends back home, which is a predominantly black space, what would it be like if they were d using this work to realize and express themselves artistically? Um, and navigating that space and not seeing any black students, barely black students, no black faculty. Why is it like this? Me being the one black student in class saying, you know, if this technology is deployed in my community, it's not going to go very well. Uh, and not having mentors or community of people around me that are thinking about these things. So it was that of being in an entrepreneurial mindset, you're creating things that are solving your own problems. And that, those are all my own problems. Uh, and Afrotopia was a result of that. Um, and so what it 
came to be was a new media festival over the course of a couple of days in New York City, NYU hosted it, ITP. The program I came out of was very nurturing and helping realize it and hosted us for two days where hundreds of us came together and thinking about how can we use technology to eradicate a lot of the racial stories that are existing today, but through a lens that's very interdisciplinary. So we're bringing people that are urban designers and architects together along with policymakers and lawyers and uh, educators and healthcare people, all of us coming together and thinking with our very different lenses of ways that we can use all of our expertise to come together and solve these problems. And if you're going to solve them, it has to be sustainable. So we need a lot of different eyes on it. Um, and so as we moved forward and the second year happened about a month ago, and Google hosted us there. Um, and we were able to not just be this group of people that are thinking about um, technology and what it's doing and kind of who to point to as far as who to blame, but it's more of what are we doing and what is all of our intelligence that has existed within us in our community for centuries, going back to that and kind of centering ourselves, centering blackness as opposed to creating a community that's centering whiteness and combating that. Uh, and then also being very speculative in its execution of we're designing a future together. And when you're building communities, it's important to think of what foundation you're creating that based off of. And so us coming together and saying that we're a community that's building this future together uh, with so many different lenses was very important and a great shift in the second year and it allowed people to feel very full of agency and another design in the way that we um, the, the way that it was executed is it's also thinking about pedagogy in a very de hierarchical framework of not being these sort of experts and we all come to listen to them and hear what they have to say but it's more of there's so many amazing people even in this room and hearing the questions that people have been asking of what if we all could have these collective conversations and not have just like the people that we think are the most intelligent um, kind of talk so tackling a lot of different things and essentially thinking of what is this world that we want to design? Um, and so in that, at Efforts Utopia, this is, these are a lot of the presenters that were speaking. And we had people like Victor talk about artificial intelligence in relation to African masks and creating African masks based off of artificial intelligence. And in thinking about that, that's really exciting because what if we could use all this sort of ancestral intelligence that we have, but we, black people have so often been removed from our cultural artifacts and just our movement into the Americas. So what if we could realize those artifacts through artificial intelligence? And and Ashley Jane Lewis, she presented on Octavia Butler and thinking about her research on slime mold and how in studying biocultures with slime mold, you're also studying how communities interact with one another because slime mold operates in very similar ways. So Afrotopia essentially is designed to think about technology as far as you know what societal impacts have existed and how technology is replicating all of those things as far as like segregation and housing and how Amazon and their same day delivery, delivery service excluded Roxbury, which is at the center of Boston, but sent same mail to everyone else. So that's just replicating um, housing segregation and then also how we can use pioneers like Octavia Butler to realize futures. Awesome. Thanks for the answer. I actually had the pleasure of joining uh, at the Afrotectopia conference, so I would highly recommend it. It's an amazing place to meet other creatives, and it's not just tailored towards people in uh, tech or just towards people in the art. It's really looking at the intersections of different um, interesting fields. Um, so join next year. Awesome. Um, next question is for Billy. Um, how do you define biomimicry? And what makes you hopeful about biomimicry and the ways it might inform technology injustice? So uh, biomimicry is usually defined as the conscious emulation of nature's strategies. So um, I'm so glad you said slime mold. That was like the perfect segue. Um, <clears throat> um, slime mold was so dope. Um, there's, there was a study done of the Tokyo Japanese, I'm sorry, not Tokyo Japanese, the, the Tokyo subway system that's taken 100 years to develop, one of the most efficient train systems in the world. Uh, there was a study uh, by some scientists done where they, they took all of the metro points that that subway system was run, run through and they put pieces of oats over a map where those locations were. And then they took cultures of slime mold and placed them over that, over that map to see how the slime mold would map to, to those locations. And what they discovered was in the course of 24 hours, 
the slime mold had spread out to every one of those oats and had reinforced all of the most efficient pathways to get to those oats. So in 24 hours, this, uh, you know, microcellular uh, organism, a collection of organisms, had created a more efficient method of transportation and distribution of resources than it's taken man 100 years to develop. Uh, and so when thinking of uh, last night's talk by Pierce and how he mentioned Sankofa, um, the thing about biomimicry is, and we, we always love to say this, is that it's a, an emerging field based on an ancient practice. Uh, and um, you, you start to really see that it seems like a lot of the trends today are all about going to what indigenous people have been doing for years. So uh, this is very much in that realm of getting back in touch with the fact that there are organisms on this planet that have been alive much longer than us that have solved a lot of the problems that we are currently either creating for ourselves or think that we need to techno technologize a solution for. Um, that, was that the phone? Yeah. Okay. No, that was great. <laughs> Um, do you mind also expanding on some of the specific places you've been traveling to study biomimicry? Maybe interesting examples, like where were you in this? Yes, so this was, this was awesome. This was in, uh, I want to say Kalispell, Montana. Uh, never been to Montana, didn't know brothers were in Montana. There's a couple of us out there. Um, shout, out to the, shout out to the other brothers. Um, I, I counted like 12 people while I was there over two days. I was counting, literally. Um, <laughs> How many of us are here? Um, shout out to my colleague, Leon, uh, who was on that trip. Uh, so in studying biomimicry, we would actually go to, um, uh, we would travel to these different locations and do what we call ecosystem immersions, where we are literally going out into the forest in, um, in uh, Tofino, uh, understanding the, the ecosystem, the ecology, the relationships of these organisms to each other, how they create a sense of community and how that community thrives, how these organisms have developed strategies and adaptations that allow them to thrive in certain uh, uh, um, environments. Um, so an example of that, one thing that we looked at was uh, we were trying to understand ways that we could solve for food deserts, uh, which, you know, are typically in uh, communities of, of, of color um, with uh, low, um, low income opportunities or, or lack thereof. Uh, and so in trying to find solutions for things like that, you start kind of breaking down, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout yeah, yeah. way. No worries. Um, you start, what, we, what we're essentially doing is we're matching the functions of the challenge to the functions that the biological solutions have. So in the instance of food deserts, we're looking at, you know, a lot of that is uh, people not having access to, to locations that have fresh fruits and vegetables and things like that. So how can we find a new way to distribute the resources from where they are to these people um, that, that need them in these, in these communities? Uh, and so through that, you start to understand the, the wisdom of ants and how certain types of ants, when, uh, when they send out their, their worker ants to find food, uh, they actually set up intermittent silos so that ants are actually cutting down on the amount of travel that they have to do so that they're wasting less energy and more ants can survive. So that became a strategy of, okay, so where are the intermittent places that we can set up food silos uh, within these communities? And then it was, okay, well, bus routes. Bus routes are something that people of low income often use as methods of travel. So where there's bus routes, these should probably be places where we have some type of, of small, um, uh, small food market that can either we call an Uber and we set up a, a thing where Uber drivers can come and deliver food or you know that kind of thing. And um, so that as an example of of applying biology to challenges at the human scale. Um, so to answer your question about where we've traveled, uh, <laughs> which was could have been a shorter answer, I'm just realizing. Um, we, we were in uh, Tofino in the Colorado Rockies. Um, we were, we've traveled to Hawaii. We were in Costa Rica um, for the show. Um, 
uh, we were in South Africa and um, uh, traveled to Thailand and a couple of, of other locations. I'm not allowed to say because yeah. the show hasn't premiered yet. October 16th, <laughs> 10 p.m., only on Animal Planet. Um, uh, <laughs> shameless, not so shameless plug. Uh, Check that out. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to go over to uh, Bridget. Uh, what has shaped your vision for a G-code house? And how do you think that black women in particular will shape the future of tech? So uh, I had to cross my leg for this one <laughs> uh, and sit up. So um, as you heard in the introduction and as I just mentioned, um, I formed G-Code House uh, out of a long-standing work that I had been doing in, um, in the Boston uh, more so specifically in the Roxbury area. So, um, by uh, I'm a trained urban planner and focused on public policy um, and worked for both city and state agencies, but I saw Boston that was gentrifying. It accelerated gentrification and that was changing rapidly, right? And wanting to create a third space for black and brown women. Um, uh, because we are often the most marginalized. So my passion and my focus and my energy has always been directed towards black and brown young women. So when this opportunity came up for me to, to, to purchase this property, I was super excited. Um, I hadn't really formulated the concept and the idea yet, um, but went in, put in a bid, um, accompanied my bid with a letter stating my relationship to the neighborhood. So just in case any of you to, you know, want to be homeowners soon, do something out of the box, <laughs> as I defined it, and, and the um, seller accepted it. But little did I know that um, uh, external forces were also competing with me, right? So as we were in that, in that process, he got in cash offers double for what I put in. But we already had a contract. And what he said to me was, bye and I'm not talking to you anymore. And I was like, whoa, I don't think this is supposed to happen in this process. So that engaged me in a year long legal battle to retain a property in the heart of Roxbury. Um, but I was dedicated, I was committed, and I was focused. I was like, if he did this to me, th he did it to somebody else, right? And we need to stop this practice. So, of course, we won the lawsuit. Um, and thank you. <laughs> and, okay, once I got the property, I was like, okay, well, great. Now, what do I do with this property, right? I knew I wanted it to be a community benefit. I didn't know exactly what that needed to look like at the point. But um, so then I started to look at other models. I started to look at, okay, this whole initiative and idea around co-living and, and that really spoke to me. I said, but we need something more um, specifically for, um, to get our young women into a place where they're self-sufficient. And sort of that pipeline was really targeting tech because that is a field and an industry where you know it's growing, it's expanding, um, it touches all of our lives, um, and it's a place where you know you can increase your income, you can afford to stay there, and not just that. I I gave birth to uh, what I call a badass young woman, <laughs> right? <laughs> So my daughter is currently living in Bushwick, and as my friend here live from Brooklyn, she's living in Bushwick and she works for Adobe. Um, but I gave birth to a, a, a young woman who was going to defeat the odds. She was not going to be a statistic, right? And looking at sort of what I poured into her, and not just me, but the village and the community um, that surrounded her, I wanted to replicate that. I was like, it's just, it's not enough to only do it for my child. I need to do it for other young women. Thank you. So, I wanted to have this house be not just a safe haven, not just be a, um, a, a property that young women live in, but where I was creating leaders who were going to go into the tech space and they were gonna revolutionize it, right? Because we know black and brown young women, women, we are trendsetters, right? When we step into a room, people know we're there. 
right? So I wanted this space to, to really speak to that. So the house footprint itself is, it's a 5,000 square foot old house that was built in 1900, and it has a 2,000 square foot carriage house. And all of that needs to be redeveloped, right? And in order for up to 14 young women to live in the house and for in the basement there to be the media lab and then an, an additional space over in the, in the carriage house where we can meet and have meetups and uh, talks and, and um, different tech talks and the like uh, in this property, but all surrounded and nestled in a neighborhood as a way to stabilize the neighborhood. And I call it disruptive stabilization, right? Because the neighborhood is being disrupted, but I'm stabilizing it because I'm offering my property an adaptive reuse of my property for this benefit and this purpose. So it, it, it it's been a long process in moving this initiative forward, but I'm committed to it because people, they get it, but it, they don't. So they understand that we need to create additional pipelines into tech, um, but it's also a, a real estate development project. So people will say, hey, this is a great idea. And then I was telling my colleagues here on the stage, and they'll throw up, you know, deuces quicker than Chris Brown, like, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. Like, yeah, but you know, I don't know, you know, I'm like, but, <laughs> but you are a billionaire. You're like, hey, yeah, I'm like, Okay, well, where's the investment, right? So we've been featured in, we've been featured in Forbes, we've been featured in Fast Company, we've been featured on Curb, but none of that translated into investment, right? Mm -hmm. And I need to tell y'all the real, real, <laughs> right? So <laughs> you can have all these, you know, accolades and people, and your 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 in print, and people are like talking about you, and then you turn around and you're like, but where's the money? And how y'all give the fire dude millions of dollars and I'm sitting here struggling. So that's the real about being an entrepreneur, being a social entrepreneur. <laughs> the fire festival, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one, that one. I'm like, how this dude, like, anyway, so y'all take me off track. <laughs> does this happen when we know that the percentages of women of color in tech uh, is, is we're about 20% in, in Silicon Valley, but outside of it, it's like 1%, right? Mm -hmm. And so we know that we have a problem. So uh, if we want products and services that are going to be reflective of all of us, then it, it's incumbent on us that we create these pipelines and we create these spaces and opportunities for more women of color to move into tech. Because, and lastly I'll say is, when we did the business plan and we looked at, there were a lot of programs that were K through 12, and there's nothing. Then it picks back up in women and leadership. So in that 18 to about 30, there's nothing. And you know once you graduate high school, resources don't follow you. So we looked at professional programs, and if you wanted to get into coding, they're like $18,000 for six months. Yeah. How are you going to pay $18,000 in a $3,000 uh, rent, right, in Boston? It can't work. So we were like, we have to provide a space where we provide housing and the educational component and combine those two to give those young women an opportunity uh, to break into this space without the hindrances of, you know, I have to think about rent, I have to think about the things that I need uh, to survive. And I, when I, again, going back to my daughter, my daughter was never house insecure, right? She never was like, well, oh, mom, we're, you know, we're, we're homeless, or where are we gonna live? And so certain things gave her that leg up and gave her that stability and the foundation that she needed so she could move forward. And so for me, it was important that I not be a gentrifier, right? Because of, of my standing and my income, I could have went in there and said, listen, I'm gonna rent this at top of the market, I'm going to be sipping pina coladas, right? <laughs> collecting my rent, and I'm going to be good, right? But I said, no, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot 
not in good conscience do that. I do not want to be part of the marketing campaign that is telling people of color who, who have turned from the residents there to placeholders now, right? Who people are telling them they need to leave. And then there's another marketing messaging telling people that, hey, you need to come to this up and coming neighborhood. Right, And so there's always these dual marketing messages that are competing for our communities and our neighborhoods. So I wanted us to be that um, stabilizing disruptor. And that is the creation of g -Code Haas. And then really lastly, I'll say this. <laughs> what, again, when I did the research, I found, in tying it back to the history, that there was a freed slave in 1847 that moved to, from the South, to Harlem and she rented out an apartment in Harlem. And she would meet other freed slaves uh, at the bus depot and she would take them into her apartment so that they weren't pulled in unscrupulous things and she would educate them because she was educated and train them and at the time it was for domestic work. She ended up buying that brownstone uh, in Harlem and it was called the White Rose Mission and this was like the first of settlement homes. And when I read it, I was like, wow, I was blown away because much of the language she used in 18 or 1900 to, to talk about supporting black women, I had in my business plan. I was like, oh, things have really not changed, right? Um, but this is needed. So she was this visionary back in, in, uh, in 1900 to put this all together and thousands of young women passed through her house. So that is the spirit that I built um, or am building G-Code House with, that it can be this um, both stabilizing but disruptive force, not only in our neighborhoods, but in the tech space. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. You truly are a visionary. It sounds like you were very intentional about, from the start, before you even purchased this property, housing needs to be accompanied by um, the traditional offerings of maybe like a, a tech um, workshop or a cohort or something. Um, finally, I'm going to ask some questions for, to Jerome. Um, in your project, As Not For, you bring attention to black graphic designers of the past whose work and influence is rarely mentioned in the classroom. Because of this institutional neglect, have you found it difficult during your research to piece together parts of their stories or find specific examples of their work? If so, how over the years has technology helped you fill in those gaps? Um, so yes, it was very difficult um, during my research pro process. I started out with um, Buddy Esquire, who's the who's circled below Spike Lee there um, on the poster. Um, he was a party flyer designer during the rise of hip hop, and his handbills were kind of the marketing tool and a catalyst of the rise of the what is now like a worldwide culture. Um, before it was just word of mouth for people to find out about the jams, where some of our like some of the legendary MCs and um, dancers came out of, and then his party flyers. And he was just a, a writer, a graffiti artist. Um, but um, he was just the artist that people knew, and they were like, hey, why don't you make some flyers? He was like, all right. Um, but his like <laughs> methods um, are just completely overlooked as like not graphic design, or called like vernacular design, um, which is, you know, not necessarily true. So I started with him, and um, Cornell has a archive, a hip hop archive, the Breakbeat Lenny um, hip hop archive, where I kind of started. Um, and I, I just knew there. I was like, there has to be more. So then, um, funny, Chicago has a rich history of black graphic design. There's um, uh, Leroy Winbush, uh, Eugene Winslow, and um, I always mix up their names. Shoot, third guy. Um, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, Leroy, uh, Leroy Winbush was the first creative director at Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine out of Johnson Publishing. Um, well, nobody knows that, right? We should know that. Um, and then there was, uh, oh yeah, Emmett, Mc, Emmett McBain, I saw his photo. Emmett McBain as well. Um, they all had their own advertising agencies, um, mostly marketing and advertising to the black community. 
And I found out about them through like image captions and like a, in an essay not about black design. <laughs> like, um, and then UIC has all of their all of their work archived, University of Illinois Chicago campus. So um, it was. I felt like when I designed this poster, I was trying to replicate my research process, which was. It felt like I was um, on Law and Order SVU putting together like <laughs> a lip chart, like this. But you know. Um, and yeah, um, now has technology help? No, technology didn't help me. <laughs> but so by that question, I was just curious if there were any instances <laughs> outside of that example, um, maybe in other projects, um, if maybe archives have become more accessible over the years, or, or if you post something on Instagram or something, and then you see people like, oh, that looks familiar, I actually have something in my attic, or I'm related to this person. Or, yeah. Wait, say, say it again, say it again. Um, so I'm curious about, in your research, to um, bring shed light on these graphic designers um, who maybe their, their work has been overlooked. Have you seen technology over the past couple of years help connect you to fill in the gaps of some of the, the work that you're working on? Yeah, it's um, it's, it's really interesting because I, I question like, is there a, is there a black graphic design aesthetic? Like, what would black graphic design be? And um, and there's no foundation for that. So for me, this what this show was kind of like just questioning what that foundation might be. And then I think the the second part of it is that um, I think about uh, Mexico, like um, they would make murals to tell. Uh, the population, the history of their country, because a lot of people were illiterate. So, like the show—not to say people aren't yelling, can't read—but like the show is uh, 47 posters, just of of archive of um, reproductions of archive material, and just like seeing all these things in the same place. It's like Cash Money Records artwork next to Black Panther newspapers, next to um, av Marlboro advertisements with the black man with bell bottoms and an afro. And you see all this stuff in one place, and you're able to draw connections through um, and cultural connections, and maybe like family connections um, through the work. You know what I mean? And um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. It's all good. <laughs> but social media has helped, though, definitely. Uh, um, <laughs> One last question for the group, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. Um, what excites you most about the possibilities of technology, imagine 20 or even 100 years from now? Um, in the fight for equity and justice. I'll let the others think while I pontificate out loud. Um, <laughs> one thing I, I totally did not mean to, I forgot to mention was uh, the research that I think kind of got me here, which was uh, we were in Hawaii and I saw a news report that um, another person of color in California got shot while sleeping in his car. And I'm in Hawaii, we're talking about sustainable design and learning from all these cool things and I can't concentrate because I'm like, this is great, but if what I'm learning has no application to people who look like me, like what the hell am I even doing here? So, uh, to answer your question in a long way, um, I then started focusing on, well, is there a way for biomimicry uh, to inform and address police shootings? And uh, that led to a very interesting um, breakdown of the history of police shootings, the history of police officers and the biological uh, elements of, of all that and kind of trying to biologize racism in a way uh, and finding solutions in nature that could address what's happening. Uh, and so anyway, the presentation tomorrow during the workshop, I'll kind of talk about that. But uh, And one reason why I love Wakanda and Black Panther was agency is so present. You see it, there's, there's this unapologetic, natural, um, self-love and confidence that you see in that film. 
Uh, and so agency matched with technology and, and our culture and our ability to create um, means that our future is, is imminent and it's here. Um, and I, I just want to say, like, no one has more creativity than the black woman. And right. I mean, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say it again. I'll say it three times if you ask me. Um, but, but I say that because um, they're, they're the first ones to step up and affirm you in a room like this. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, <laughs> they're and they're, they are honestly at the, you all are honestly at the, the forefront of every movement. Um, about affecting things for the whole and the collective. So I think with agency, the black woman, our c collective creativity, um, and the tools that we now have at our disposal through different mediums of technology, um, like anything is possible. Did that, was that enough time? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, fair. Um. Yeah, I would say even just like time of having more time for innovation. I was, I've been watching Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix mm -hmm. and learning about how they were making songs, daisy chaining tape decks to record like loops. And now I just get to click a new track on Ableton and that's the same thing that the, what they've done. So I think time for innovation is very exciting. Um, and even just talking about the work that was presented after Tectopia of just using, I mean, there's a lot of talk around artificial intelligence and how dangerous it is because it replicates a lot of social injustice problems. Um, but it also creates a lot of opportunity for things to be realize that we can't possibly do as human beings, mm -hmm. or at least not, uh, it just it, it expounds it in a lot of different ways. So I think that's exciting. Um, and Afrotectopia also had a summer camp where uh, we piloted for New York City summer, New York City public school kids, grades 6 to 12, um, and bringing together culture. It was, root, the curriculum was rooted in black culture, activism, design, art, and technology. Uh, and the days were spent studying black pioneers. So um, W.E. Du Bois and his data visualizations and then students would research and then create their own data visualizations or the black arts movements and AACM and Afrocobra and them creating electronic instruments and then, or instruments and then us creating electronic instruments using scratch and um, other devices and sound designing of just all of these of, for me, I've been doing a lot of research in cultural memory and understanding where we come from and all this intelligence and then being able to apply it in settings where these kids are young and can gain this confidence because so much of technology is a confidence game of feeling like you're adequate uh, and getting them started early and even if it's confusing, it's still, as you do it more and more, you feel this comfort when your professors are saying something because you're like, oh yeah, I remember I did this before. So all of that getting in early and teaching them that we've been doing this for a very long time uh, and bring it all together excites me in thinking about all the other programs that are doing very similar things of bringing together kids uh, and using culture and technology and thinking about it uh, in very engaging ways. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm fighting a cold. So um, I had some notes. So 1% of black women are VCs. And that creates a sense of urgency, right? Um, in order to um, use tech as a way of, of people creating services and products where um, their companies can go live and basically they can make money um, and then reinvest in the community, right? Because um, 100% of nothing is nothing. So we need money. Um, we need people who are, are creating, again, um, in those spaces, creating services that reflect all of society as opposed to just a few, or we will fall into just um, maintaining the status quo. And, um, and that's not acceptable, right, um, for us to do. Um, and also, um, uh, for uh, G-Code House, um, for me, it's about um, really creating a space that is an anchor, um, not just for a neighborhood, 
um, but for women in tech. So when we had our soft launch um, and it featured several young women were on the panel and in and, and various um, sort of um, uh, levels of their careers in, in, in the tech, um, one was still at Wentworth. And what we collectively came away with was that they said it was easier for them to learn coding than to go and work in these spaces. Because they were not, they were almost invisible in these spaces, right? So unless we are really opening up tech and, and really focused and intentional about creating additional pipelines into tech um, so that we do have products, we do have services, we do, we are creatives, we are making things and it's reflective of our culture, of who we are, the contributions that we made, um, we are not going to see the results that we want because one if we're not getting, um, having critical mass in that space, we're not staying there. Um, we're not in those, uh, going to stay in a, in a hostile environment where we're not seen, we're undervalued or devalued and not welcome. So um, it's important for me to not only um, support and encourage young women to really be leaders in this space, but for them to reach back and to say to other young women that you belong here. Um, you belong in this space and your voice needs to be heard and your contribution needs to be felt. Um, I mean, I just feel like uh, black people are always like, uh, oh shit, we're being left out. Let's do something. So I think that, even, I mean, that's even with my show, right? Like I was studying graphic design. I was like, oh shit, there's no black designers. I need to do something about this. So I feel like, like I feel like that's what Afrotechtopia is doing. It's like actually moving ahead of the curve. And uh, so I feel like, uh, you know, looking towards the future, especially in tech, um, I feel like we have to start innovating for ourselves before that, that issue even arises where we're, we're feeling excluded um, or have been excluded already and be like, we got to, you know, always playing catch up. Um, yeah, that's it. All right, awesome. Uh, we're going to open it up now to questions from the audience. It's one, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm Jason Minter. I'm out of Houston, where I build uh, basically Har Harvey Disaster Recovery mo Housing, because um, it takes three years to build housing after a dis uh, disaster, apparently. Um, first, I just want to thank you guys for your contributions. It's pretty cool, and everything that you're working on, it's actually solving our problems. Uh, but I was thinking, based on something Billy was saying, that about the ants in a food desert, essentially, and you know, finding um, you know, that, that way to, uh, you know, put the stores where the bus routes are and distributing the fooding, you know, via uh, Uber or whatever takes place. And that reminded me of, so in, for four years I was in Cleveland doing community development work in uh, Kinsman and Central neighborhoods, so that's like the highest concentration of public housing between New York and Chicago is in that neighborhood. So it's obviously a food desert. and. When I was there, while we were dealing with that, you know, a lot of the idea, at the same time, all the grocery stores were beginning to uh, offer free, free or cheap delivery of their groceries. So now you see that everywhere, Whole Foods and whatever does that. And there's, there's always this idea, okay, there's not a grocery store, but can we distribute the food these other ways? And we kind of were talking about this optimization. And then there was always this conflict between the placemaking of creating, you know, a grocery store, a place in the neighborhood where people go, versus this completely kind of digital, optimized route. The grocery store already exists downtown. It's, it's seven blocks away. You can have a, a bus, so you can have a whole train of, of Uber drivers to distribute it to everybody. And I kind of just want to hear the, the panel's understanding or what their thinking is between uh, just like the peak optimization through like digital means versus uh, the need to place make. Anybody want to answer? <laughs> I don't want to go first anymore. 
I don't entirely understand the place make part. That's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Because I have like I have examples of digital optimization and how harmful that can be. But thinking about place make is hard. <coughs> so can you expand on okay. Like Um, just to expand, it seemed like there was almost two different directions because obviously the house is true, like in the heart of it, place making. It's like you have this place in Roxbury, right? And you're saying you're going to hold your ground. You're going to create a space that's special, it's magical, all the things are happening there. And then, and then also the Afrotectopia is that in the same way that this is place making, it's like this uh, brief utopia. You know, it's like a place in your mind, it's a place in a, a day, a year, and you go there, you, you do the Mecca, you go to Afrotectopia and you feel a way, and being in that place is important. Of course, there's probably some people that are online, you know, watching different things, but it's not the same as being there. Um, and so I don't know if that, and then, and then the opposite is the optimization, you know, just the solve the problem at all costs, you know, get the food to the kids. Um, mm -hmm. And then that, that struggle. So I'm part of a program uh, to um, Roxbury Cultural District and my colleagues here and um, out of the Boston Foundation. Um, and, uh, and I also want to, for the just a quick shout out for the renderings you saw. Um, they were done by the architectural firm Sasaki. Um, and they have been just amazing in terms of their lips matching their hips and <laughs> offering pro bono work for me to design the renderings and, and, and help to build out this concept. But for us at um, a Roxbury Cultural District and uh, Place Leadership Network, it's more about place keeping, right? And G-Code is part of place keeping as opposed to place making. Because we, we already have a space. You know, we already have neighborhoods. We have active neighborhoods. We have um, thriving small businesses in those neighborhoods. We have art, arts and cultural that all can be enhanced, right? But we want to keep the essence of who we are as a neighborhood. So when you see that juxtaposed to when they slap on labels on that, um, on the, the housing, when it's luxury, right? It's no longer, they're not place making. Right, it, it, it sort of erases all of what was. So uh, we just did a walkthrough here of Chinatown and Chinatown is shrinking, right? And it, Chinatown is fighting for placekeeping, right? To keep its identity, to keep its small businesses, to keep its community. And for me, tech is more about, um, more about humans than machines. Right, and how do we put the emphasis on human beings and people as opposed to, to machines and create those spaces where uh, technology can enhance the engagement between human beings, but it shouldn't replace it, right? It shouldn't, all that history and um, what people have come to identify with and what gives them sort of a sense of belonging and place shouldn't be uh, just wiped out with labels like luxury because it's it, of its proximity to um, to a downtown or to transit or to what have you uh, because it makes other people um, comfortable uh, moving into that space. Awesome. Anyone else want to give an answer? Otherwise we can I'll just I'll take a quick stab at it. I think you need both. Um, you need the ability to quickly mobilize people Right, And I think you get that mostly through technology and digital distribution of information. But you also need a way to bring people together, galvanize them towards action. And you usually need that to take place in, in a location. Uh, and then you need a permanent location where that can become a beacon to draw further um, action and development and cultivation of ideas. To. So I think you need both. It, sometimes it's in order. Uh, more than it is needing one or the other. Um, I think it really just kind of depends on what you, what you want to do. Like this, like this is every two years, but look, look who's here and look what's come out of it, right? This could, you know, take place anywhere, but now it has a home, right? And so now everyone knows where to go. 
the next time that this is happening, right? And it, it just continues to grow because there's a permanent place. Um, and then also, the thing that actually brought me to biomimicry was after Katrina hit New Orleans, going down there with 500 other Howard University students and just trying to like help and seeing in America like what took place and, and understanding what happened to it and then trying to find solutions um, led me to biomimicry. So it's very much rooted in um, understanding how to not let stuff that's happening to our communities happen and seeing nature as, as a source of solutions. So any architecture, landscape students, this is a quick note. Um, I see you. Um, um, mangrove trees are something to study for places that are prone to flooding um, as a design solution for new types of housing. That's all I want to say. <laughs> all right. I think we have a question over here. Peace, y'all. Um, my, my name is Destiny. My question is about collective ownership um, of space. Um, I've been in a lot of conversations about black people, artists, being like, we need a building. It, we need multiple buildings. <laughs> we need spaces to exist before there's no more spaces for us to convene. So um, I guess my question is, do you think it's possible to gather enough energy and focus it um, and enough capital for us to actually invest in ourselves and to create space for ourselves that's not just a conversation of begging to be at the table with other developers who are non-black, but um, but for us to have an insular conversation, to kind of go back to your point about things not being just always focused on white supremacy and our combating it, but just coming from a place of our own um, sovereignty. And then to add on to that, um, thinking about this idea of picking and choosing your battles um, because there are many buildings under uh, in danger of being sold like the Harriet Tubman house and other places in Boston um, and I've, I've been hearing this thing where it's like well, we got to be careful about which battles we fight and we have to we got to pick and choose what's already sinking versus something that hasn't been planted yet and so would you in this time, put your energy into trying to preserve what already exists or in trying to get enough energy and resources to build something new? Yeah. So you're not Thank just talking you. about architecture, right? You're talking about community. <laughs> not just talk about buildings, right? You're talking about, okay. Um, I think. Oh, okay. So. I mean, just to answer that, like in my, having had done my research, a, a bunch of people, uh, educators in particular, have popped up and were like, oh, I'm doing this work too. So I have like an ad hoc community of, of a bunch of folks who are interested in um, representing marginalized aesthetics in design and art. Um, but we don't have a place, it's like just email and Skype <laughs> a lot of time. Um, and I feel like that, Di di digital space is, is valid as well as like having a, a physical space to be in. Uh, we meet at like book fairs and stuff like this, but um, it's happening and we just don't have a place yet. But I don't know if we will, have, will ever have the money to, because it's not enough people willing to invest in it. And from my from my point of view, I, I, don't, I can't ask. You gotta ask the rich people. <laughs> <laughs> ask the fire. Uh... Um, for me, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was when I purchased this property, I didn't, um, I knew that I wanted a property in Roxbury and it was just at the right time. I had no idea I was going to enter into a, a year long legal battle. Right, that cost me a lot of money. So I had skin in the game before anything, before I, you know, even even 
taking uh, control of the property, but I do believe that site control is important because we get to define the narrative. We get to define what happens in that space, right? And how much of ourselves we bring into a space. So the fact that I do have this property right now puts me at a different sort of engagement and level when I am talking to people about uh, rehabbing the property or, you know, wh whose money should I be uh, interested in, in, um, in taking, right? Because I don't want uh, what the vision is to be uh, changed based on the funds that you take in. So if, if there is an opportunity for us to come together as a collective, I think you should definitely do that. And and secure spaces like physical spaces. As if it wasn't important, you wouldn't see all these buildings popping up everywhere, right? Space, building, the built environment, it's important that, um, that we have agency and ownership over it um, as a way of both as I mentioned, placekeeping, um, but also defining what happens in that space and who is who benefits from that space. I also think just what are your intentions? Like, what do you want to do? If you want to create spaces and design them, that's a whole other thing than creating movements around, um, say, like creating art shows in certain spaces. Like you can just, there's different ways to use your energy. And for me, and being in the beginning stages, as opposed to investing in a space and using my energy to create and do all the legalities and paying for housing, I'm instead using that money to pay teachers to run the summer camp. Or I'm using my own access of having relationships with Google or NYU to have them offer space for free where I can just have events there. So it's kind of like just using what you have, bloom where you're planted until you can get to where you need to be and you have the access of capital to build this place now you can easily it's also like this whole mindset of um, i forgot what it's called but when you're going through a grocery store and you're and how they always have or any store and they always have all the like trinkets cool things at the end it's just like that exhaust that exhaust of just uh, when you're in your early stages of developing something and you're holding on to money here and there and then it's just it makes it uh it's just um there's this whole psychology thing of if you're focused very specifically on uh, capital when you don't have enough, it creates a sort of exhaust where you're just spending in, I guess, wasteful ways. I don't know, it's hard to describe um, that, but it's just like, what are your intentions? Essentially, what are you trying to do? Getting down to the bare minimum and satisfying that before you bite too much than you can use. And let me just say too quickly, if you don't own, you can be displaced, right? and then they just build over our history. Mm. And we're relegated to a plaque. Right. Mm. So Phyllis Wheatley Percy was here, thing. you know? <laughs> and she was somewhere here in this plaque. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> you know? And that's important. So it's important to, to think about, yes, what the, the use of the space and, and, and what you're trying to accomplish, but also if it's, what I speak to, if it's housing or, 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 or stabilizing a neighborhood, yes, get in there, buy, own, you know, fight for it. Um, that, that is always, to me, a winning battle, right? Because at least in Roxbury, <clears throat> as we're fighting this accelerated gentrification, only 20% of people in the, in the neighborhood own homes. 20%. So then when they come in and say, hey, we want to put in 200 micro units, micro, be, micro yeah. like, you're like, who lives, who would want to live in that? I mean, if you have to, certainly. But I, I try to push them to get to them to think about, okay, well, if, if someone was, um, uh, an elderly person wants to downsize and move into a micro unit, that's fine. But that's, but they get to determine and dictate what comes into the community because they own the land, and then the land becomes more valuable than the people. So then they just displace you and move you out, and then they push you to the margins, right, where there isn't really an economy there yet, and now you're trapped again in this cycle of poverty because you're further away from um, the center of gravity or the center of where things are happening. Um, so for me, I, I would err on the side of, of own, 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 if you can. Uh, 
Yes, That's, that deserves that deserves all that that you're doing. Just really quickly, I a thousand percent agree with that. Like, own the land and then whatever you want to do with the building. If you want to build Harriet Tubman a new house, right. <laughs> you got the land so you can do that, right? Like, ownership is so much more important than I think a lot of stuff that we might want to focus on. I'm I'm not big on preservationist architecture personally, so I'd rather do something new with the creative agency that we have. Um, and and uh, we, can, we can talk about that afterwards and why I say that, because I heard them groans, I heard it. Um, I, I think landmarks are important, but I think there's so much more creativity that we have, uh, the ability to manifest presently, that can still speak to the heart of that. I'd rather own that land and then do something in the spirit of what she was about than preserving the, the thing that represent the conditions that she was living in personally. But ownership. Yes. All right. We have time for one more question. I saw one over here shoot up. It's one of a mic. Hi. Um, I'm Nikita Thomas. I am an assistant professor of graphic design at the University of Illinois in Champaign. Um, I am a true like South Side Chicago in. Um, I really do appreciate the collection of voices here today and practices because I was going into this initially thinking that I was going to hear very direct ways of using technology in your practices, but I'm you know, coming up against the fact that there are indirect ways of using technology as well. So thank you for that. Um, I think this question is more targeted towards Billy because I was introduced to biomimicry very recently and it was a teacher who was angry with me <laughs> at my niece's school because every time that I would come in, I would be like, yo, it's dark in this classroom. No wonder why my niece is falling asleep. She needs some sunlight. And so the, every time I would come, I would like make these like natural statements to why the kids are like slumping in class. <laughs> so she's like, you, you have a very biomimetic way of talking. I'm like, what's biomimetic? <laughs> looked it up and, it, and this whole idea of like biomimicry is very interesting to me and um, I know that you talked about it as a way for us to use uh, looking towards nature and biology for solutions to these real life problems but then it came to mind and this is really me asking you for a definition at this point it came to mind that if you know if it's about that maybe it's about also on the flip side, understanding that we are creating the biologies that we're currently in. So it's not just about looking to nature, but also the, the biologies that we're creating. And what's the impacts of that? Because if we're creating like shitty biologies, then, and we're looking biomimetically at those biologies, then it can have like some bad implications for us. So I was just wondering, is that even a thing? Like, is that a way that biomimetic thinkers are, are thinking. I don't know. The, the clapping is going to be better than the answer that I give. So I'm just um, no, I mean, so I think I think an important thing in this reply is to have a definition of what we're talking about as biology and and. And our biology, when you, when, you mean, when you say that, I think I might need a clarification of what you mean by that. Um, but I will say that our human biology is also part of what we are looking at. Like, there's, there's so many different examples of you know, our own ecosystems, right? Like you got bacteria in your gut that's keeping your food you know, processing and all that. You got bacteria on your teeth that are helping your teeth not rot, all these different things. So in that frame, there's definitely our own biologies that we are messing up through processed foods and all of that. Um, side note, we are the most alien things on our planet now because of 
what we're putting in our bodies. We're not even breaking down our bodies when we pass the way that we normally would to be part of the ecosystems uh, of this planet. So that's a side note. But, um, um, but well, I mean, all, <laughs> all, of our, all of the preservatives that we eat become a part of us. And you know those little microplastics that are in the, the exfoliating stuff. This is not answer your question, but it's really fascinating. Um, <laughs> all of the microplastics that are used in all these exfoliation products, they're being dumped out into the ocean, which means that fish are now eating these little microplastic things. And some of those fish we now eat. Uh, the 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 medicine that's being poured into toilet drains are creating hermaphroditic fish. Um, because the, the hormones are changing the biology of these organisms and some of those things we eat. So to answer your question, yes, we are messing with a lot of our own biological systems that we're completely unaware of. Um, and that's, that's not even us trying to tweak the genetics of other things. So I just read a report where there was an experiment done where they were trying to leverage um, artificial intelligence to come up with a way to address Mosquito, um, mosquito issues because of you know diarrhea and all the other things that mosquitoes can pass on. Malaria, sorry, diarrhea is a <laughs> symptom of malaria. Um, <laughs> but uh, so they they alter the genes of this uh, this certain generation of mosquitoes so that they would be infertile, thinking that they would. Uh, recreate uh, re or procreate with some other mosquitoes and then wipe out that whole population. And what they found was that it didn't work. It just made more resilient mosquitoes to that same thing. So um, there's a quote from Jurassic Park, like, life will find a way, right? Like, the organisms on this planet are as creative as we are, and in a lot of the instances, more faster. Um, so yes, that is all things we should be mindful of. Did that answer your question? OK. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to give yeah. one last example. Go ahead. Real quick. I just, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so passionate about this right now. Uh, one, last, <laughs> one last example. Uh, they're finding that elephants are actually evolving to not have tusks because so many males have been poached that the ones who have the, ge the, the genetic marker that doesn't produce the, that doesn't produce tests, tusks are the ones that are still around to mate with. So they're actually addressing this, this problem of poaching in their own biology as a result of people poaching them for their tusks. Rattlesnakes are doing the same thing. People are hunting rattlesnakes out in the West and they're evolving to not have a rattler. So it's crazy right now. I'm not gonna say nothing else for the rest of the panel. All right, all right. <laughs> On that note, let's let's thank these incredible thank these incredible panelists. Thank you. And we're gonna move on with the programming and hear what's next. Okay, well my mind is blown, so let's uh, <laughs> let's take a break so we can process all of that together. Um, thank you all so much. You are brilliant, and let's support these people in their work. Let's get this house funded. Let's watch this show. Let's get this graphic design project to continue, and let's go to Afrotechtopia next year as a collective. Okay? We have the power to support each other, and during this break, I hope you will connect with someone that you're going to help support after this conference is over. So we're going to meet back here at 345. Unfortunately, our guided meditation was canceled due to a family emergency, but go enjoy the sunshine, meditate on your own or with your friends, and, and go to the Just City Cipher if you have not gone. It's incredible. We'll see you back here at 345. Thank you.